Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today was the executive producer and writer for the Emmy Award winning TV series Cheers, a published author, co-founder of the podcast network Ricochet and host of the weekly podcast Martini Shot. <laughs> yeah, not <laughs> <Please>. wine. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Rob Long, everybody. Uh, Rob is a graduate from Yale University, and he also spent two years studying at UCL School of Film, Theater, and Television. He began his career writing and producing TV's long-running series, Cheers, and served as co-executive producer in its final season. During his time on Cheers, the show received two Emmy Awards and two Golden Globe Awards. Rob has twice been nominated for an Emmy and has received a Writers Guild of America Award. His podcast network, Ricochet, garners four to five million downloads per month. I should get on that network. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he writes regularly for the Washington <laughs> Examiner and Commentary Magazine, has been a contributing editor at the National Review since 1993. His most, be most recent book, Bigly, Donald Trump in Verse, is a comical string of Trump's most popular quotes arranged in poetry form. Rob serves as co-president on the board of directors of My Friend's Place, an agency for homeless teens in Hollywood, and is on the board of the American Cinema Foundation. He's also an active and passionate member of the Southern Foodways Alliance, and he's here because he's also an avid wine enthusiast. Yeah. Welcome, Rob. Anything you'd like to add? I uh, know that sounds. I, that's. I. I don't even know who that guy is. Don't you? I tell people all the it's time. Like, like people read your, your bio, and I'm like, who? That, that's who's me. That? Wow. I, I yeah. Did that? It, it took a long time to do all that, so it's like I'm kind of. If I did it today, I'd be tired. But like, <laughs> and also some of that stuff's a little out of date, so I should correct that. But but the, the gist of it is true. So I, I am not that person, but I technically am that person. I I know what you mean. No. I know what you mean. Um. So Rob, what are we drinking tonight? So this is a 1998. Uh, Cas de Tournelle. It's uh, Santa Steph. I've had this in my cellar for a while. Um, and when I was living in LA, I would uh, I collected wine. I had it. I lived in LA for thirty years. You can see the sediment on the side there, um, and uh, which is a good sign. It means I actually stored it right. Yeah, it means uh, it's doing what it's supposed yeah. to do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then I brought it all to New York when I moved to New York. And I thought, um, and I, you know, in LA, you have, all you have is room. <laughs> and so I had plenty of room to store the wine and store it like in those big coolers, like the, the way they're supposed to. And then when I moved to New York, you don't really have that kind of room, or at least I don't have that kind of room. So um, I decided what I'm going to do is drink it. And instead of, because like, and I know people, I have a friend of mine who's a very, very avid wine collector. And even he sort of calculated recently that he would be 117 years old by the time he finished drinking all his wine if he drank a bottle a day or something. And he thought, oh, that's no, no good. I got to start drinking it now. I have to drink it. And give it away and drink it, and that's that's what I'm doing. I'm yeah, drinking it. I think that's great. I think during quarantine that became a thing, uh, a thing again, um, with uh, former Wall Street Journal to, uh, writers Dorothy Gator. Yeah, yeah. So they so we, back in the day, like in the early nineties, they started uh, open that bottle. Open that bottle night was fantastic. Right. Yeah. So it got revived during quarantine because, you know, I had Kevin's rally on, and he said the same thing. He's like, I started drinking all my wine. I'm not leaving to yeah. my kid. He's like, his son, his son is in the wine, but he's like. Hey, Dad, you know, that DRC is like, that's worth $25,000. I was like, we yeah. should sell. He's like, no, 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 no. No, I'm drinking that. I bought it. I also think it's kind of a weird thing. I mean, I, I get it. I understand people when they make the argument, the, the investment argument, or they make it to themselves. But I don't know. Like, what does that even mean? If, if it's worth money, then sell it. Right. If you like it as money, then turn it into money. Um, but you didn't buy it for the, for the money. So either drink it or sell it. But don't like weirdly put it in limbo where it's you're storing it and waiting for some. I don't know what are you going to wait for that DRC the some twenty five thousand dollar a bottle event in your life. Right when is like, that? Well, uh, well, I don't know. Is this twenty? Is it or is this twenty thousand dollars a bottle? Or maybe this is only a fifteen thousand dollar bottle day. Uh, and like I don't know. Like I, and then what if you open it and I'm, I don't know. Like I've opened really good wine for people and I've noticed that some of them just you're know, like yeah this is fine. Well that's the thing too. Yeah. Like yeah. who are you opening it with, right? Right. I mean so. And and also then you hold it like, and it's corked. That's the worst thing. Yeah, somehow like I, I actually feel like I cook more than I care. I, I care more about food than wine. Okay. So um, at a certain point, the food I was cooking um, seemed to be seemed to go for a different kind of wine. Frankly, mm -hmm. a cheaper kind of wine. Yeah. And so now I find like I get a couple cases you know a month or every other month from Kermit Lynch in in Berkeley, which is a great wine importer. Uh, and you know some of those bottles are thirty dollars a piece, mm -hmm. which is a lot for you know like he's got more, but like that's that's a that's an expensive bottle, 
But for him, he also sells these great French bottles from the south of France and Provence for like seventeen dollars a bottle, yep. and these fantastic uh, Loire reds and whites for sometimes eleven, fifteen dollars. Like, it's great. And then you can open that bottle and you can just drink it every night, and you don't feel like well, they're there's delicious no, wines, right, too. Right. No, they're great wines. Yeah. You know, but you know, to, to Kermit does rep Quintarelli, which is like a thousand bucks a bottle. Yeah, that's right. He, he does that. He, he yeah. discovered Kush. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's not like he's not. Uh, but you're right. Not a dot org. He, he's, he, not, yeah. he's about. A, he's a guy who's about. Um, you know, wine belongs to food. Yeah. And yeah. and to do that, you know, um, like you said, you like he'll have a killer Borgonia for thirty bucks or something. You know, so I, I totally agree with you. Um, all right, man. Um, and you know this is this is doing exactly what it's supposed yeah, to do. Yeah. This probably... is Bordeaux. Uh, my descriptor for older Bordeaux is shit dipped pencil tip. It's got pencil lead and it's got yeah, right. It, it, you know they you might call it barnyard funk or manure. Yeah, there's lots of. I'm from right. Jersey. It's yeah, shit. yeah, it's shit. Right, 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 right. <laughs> the uh, I always love that like bar- there's there's uh, barnyard odors or the if you into the stuff you can read Robert Parker who's a great great wine critic and probably maligned too much but like it, I would agree yeah but it, but you know he's pretty solid uh if you know what he likes then you kind of understand why it's 100 if you don't you know but he would always say that his was redolent of cigar box <laughs> licorice ground meat and barnyard yeah. I'm like wow that doesn't sound no. that actually literally sounds like garbage yeah <laughs> but it's really good wine <laughs> oh this is too much fun. I, 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 we could just keep and, and another one of uh, my favorite descriptors is, is cat pee. You get cat pee in certain wines. You do get a little cat pee in there. Yeah. I mean, but it's like people. It's like, people are, yeah, I'm like, no, that it doesn't mean like it's doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. I don't. No, I wouldn't drink cat urine. Well, but I mean, if you it, I mean, make you live forever. You, if you go to a spa, that's what eucalyptus smells like to a lot of people. <laughs> exactly. You know, let's, let's get over it, you know. <laughs> so according I'm to just Google, pour myself another yeah, glass. Yeah, help you yourself. That's all right. Um, you're originally from Maryland. Is yeah, I was born in Baltimore. Okay. Oh, The Wire. Yeah, that's um, right. That's what people say. The Wire. <laughs> Tell me about your childhood. Well, it was like the, just exactly like The Wire. If you saw The Wire. Uh, well, I was we were born there. Um, family was from there in uh, Northern Virginia. Uh, and then we moved to Europe, lived in Europe for a few years when I was a kid. And then we moved back to the States. We moved back to the States. We moved to Northern California. Where Where in Europe did you live? In Holland, of okay. all places. I was like, so I was like, it's gonna, did it influence wine culture? No. 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 Nope. Holland influenced, influenced nothing. It was like a completely <laughs> it's a ridiculous place. You're going to go all the way to Europe and end up in Holland. But it seemed like the place to go in which my, my dad was working at the time. Um, and, then, uh, and then back to Northern California. So okay. that's kind of like when I was becoming aware of the, the wines that I was aware of were French and then than Napa. Okay. Uh, and, to, to, and to this day, I, the wines I know are French, and I don't know any really, – I don't really know any California wines. Mm. There's just too many of them, and they're really hard to keep track of. So I, I just sort of said, oh, I don't have to know these. I, I, I trust people to know them for me. Um, and I think that is sort of – I mean, I think people – I think we forget that you don't have to know anything. You I know, love that you know. about you. I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, I, yeah, I, I know a fair amount about wine, but I have, I'm, I'm a wine guy who has a wine guy. I got people I'm like, yo, what do you think yeah, of this? Yeah. And I, and I read critics knowing what their palate is. You mentioned early, like, don't be mad at Parker. You don't like what he likes. It's fine. Yeah. You know, now you know what you don't like, but like, he likes it big and yeah, he likes, he likes it in your face. Pencil tip dipped in shit. Yeah. Well, yeah. He's yeah. Like, That's in yeah. your face. Um, oh, it's good. Good. Yeah. Um, your parents. What was your dad? What did he do? He for was work? in the electronics business. Okay, uh, and that was like so bright early, you know, early mid seventies. So that was, uh, you know, there there were three places. There was Europe, and that point, the town ta- town we were in in, in Holland was called Eindhoven, and it was sort of the uh, the, the Silicon Valley center of Europe at the time because there was a big uh, big Dutch electronics company, worldwide company called Philips, that was based there. Okay, and so it was sort of the magnet. And then, uh, then when it was time to come back to the states, we went to Northern California because that was Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, you know, I was away at school. My brother was away at school too. They moved back to New England, where my mother was essentially from, where I was born. And they, um, and that was like Route 128 was where they lived. So um, he kind of like surfed the 70s, 80s, 90s um, tech business. Um, and you know, essentially, I know nothing about that. Like I can say about that. You know, <laughs> I wish I could. You know, he was an engineer. He was a really smart yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really cool. Um, were your parents? Were they uh, into film and TV? I mean, or are you just a kid who watched TV and film? Or? Yeah, I mean, they were not. I mean, I think, I think they were. There's a white knuckle kind of high wire act ride for them when I announced at some point in college that I this is what I wanted to do. Between that and actually getting paid to do it. There was some tense. I mean, they never shared that with me, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure 
I didn't send like, you to Yale. Right. To like what I don't you know, writer. I don't think I can afford for you to be a screenwriter, if you know what I mean. Like so uh and I, I guess I, I, I guess I realized that when I got my first job. And their thrill, their their joy w- uh, went beyond normal parental pride. Mm-hmm. It went also to like this. Oh, thank God, we don't have to worry about him anymore. Um, which is probably, uh, uh, you know, I probably would have done better had I been worried about me a little bit more. And they worried about them a little less. Worry about me a little less. But that's just the way it is when you have kids. I guess you just. I don't have kids, but if you have kids, I think that's what you do. You like you just naturally think. Oh, I hope. I hope this isn't a disaster. Yeah. And I hope, because I don't want it to be a disaster for this child that I, you know, technically, biologically have to love, <laughs> but also because I just I just can't afford it. I want, like, you know, my parents, I want to, we want to travel. We want to go to Paris. We don't want to give our money to, to this child struggling. To, to, to live his ridiculous, right. idiotic dream in L.A. <laughs> so um, you, you, went, you went to high school in California? You were back on the East Coast? Right? Back on the East Coast. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, Yale, your first choice? Yeah, I mean, I went to a fancy boarding school, so and back okay. in the day, so you kind of like could. Th- this is not the way it is anymore, uh, thank God. But you kind of like you know, if you had certain, you know, you could kind of. No, it was circles. I I, yeah. I went to school in New Haven, and I, you know, and I kind of know, you know, like like if you went to one school, you got into Princeton. It was like right. yeah, if you went to this school, right. you were getting into Yale. That it's it was like yeah. a, it was a racket. <laughs> I mean, it's still a racket, but at least it's a slightly more fair racket. Yeah, but it's not that much more fair. It's just it's a ra- you know I don't, I mean. I, I I dream of the day that people. I shouldn't say this because I, I can. I just taught my first class at. <laughs> I, was, I, I teach Wednesdays now at NYU. I okay. teach in a writing thing, and um, it, it does seem like people are there just kind of because not, not the students I met today seem really smart and engaged. Okay, but just in general, right? It feels I think a lot of people are just sleepwalking through the most expensive four years of their lives. Well, it's not on them, so. Right, 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 right. <laughs> It's like you know, maybe maybe you know, take the money, take half the money, and travel for two years. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, actually, I think all uh, all kids would be better off if they just like, yeah. I think I think a, a gap year where you could actually yeah. get a student loan to travel would be a, yeah. a, a cool thing. Yeah, and, and and I would just do it in and in exchange, you don't do four years, you do three. Yeah, I think that would I think that, and I used to work in and for a nonprofit in education. We call path college stuff, and I was like, yeah, I think stuff needs to change for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, you went to Yale, <clears throat> um, I went to Southern, because I'm a state school boy, um, but we got to talk New Haven yeah. Pizza, man. Oh, yeah. Wh- what was your, what was your spot? What was well, your, well, I can't say the spot, because that's, a, so what was your place? Yeah, the spot was actually your place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there's two ways to look at it, right? There's the, really the good pizza that's famous, Sally's or Pepe's. Um, or Sally's and Peppies now. I think they changed a little it's bit. It's Sally's, Peppies, for, 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 uh, Frank and Pe- Peppies. No, right? it's it's uh, Frank. It's, it's yeah, it's Frank Peppies, but it's called right, Peppies. Right, right, yeah, right. That's the thing. Um, and they were both really, really good, and they both remain really, really good. At least that past couple of years, I was there two years ago. Uh, and they have sort of famous white clam pizza, which yep. is a very New Haveny thing. It's yep. delicious. And then it in New Haven. Yeah. Um, uh, wood fired, um, uh, wood fired, yeah, wood, yeah. wood fired. Well, no, p- um, coal, 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 yeah, blistered crust, right? Really, really good. Charred, yeah. Like that, yeah. most people in America would think, oh, you burnt that pizza. No, like, it's no, good. That's yeah, a lab- level flavor yeah. pizza. And you know, and the and the classic Neapolitan style, kind of sparing on the toppings. Yeah, you not know? a lot of cheese. Yeah. You don't go crazy. Yeah, not a lot of sauce. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a- delicious. I mean, <coughs> I like them both. But as a student, as an undergraduate, um. Like you're not gonna, I'm gonna walk. You know, we're lazy. Like you're gonna walk all the way down there. No, I know it's just for Street. a slice. Yeah, that's not. Uh, so there was a great place that's not there anymore uh, called Naples Pizza, and Naples Pizza delivered did slices and then slices of like they would do in the afternoon uh, a pizza that was just uh, cinnamon toast basically cinnamon butter on it, mm. and then they you could get a that and like a you know a cup of coffee or something. Um, and that was really good, and it was like much closer to classic New York slice. Probably the closest thing is like you know, um, Joe Joe's Pizza, mm-hmm. or like a cla- or, or even Bleecker Street, like classic New York slice. Um, and then because it's New England, right? People forget about this when they live in other parts of the country. Like there's a huge number of Greeks, and like the Greeks run everything, like coffee shops and stuff, and diners. Like, yeah, and a Greek pizza place 
was a, a staple of a New England town, and there was one called Yorkside. It's still there. Yeah, I know Yorkside. Yeah, and they it's make good. good pizza. They make good pizza. And there's a there's a place. And that's what you got a lot of people. People don't realize New Haven is pretty diverse um, because of Yale. <laughs> um, but there's actually a Middle Eastern place, uh, right, uh, right around the corner near Yale, and they wood fire. They make New Haven pizza. Right. And and then my wife's from New Haven. She oh wow. She was a modern girl. She liked modern beats. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's you know that's fancy. Yeah. Right? That, yeah. Well, it's also you know it's, it's authentic. It, it, yeah, it's yeah. authentic. I think they came out in the '30s or '40s and probably yeah. the '20s. So they're right. right there. They're one of the big three. And then uh, I, yeah, I don't know if you go back for reunions, but have you been to Bar yet? No. See, I haven't been back in a couple <laughs> years. Yeah. So you got to go to Bar. Trust me, you want to get the mashed potato and bacon pizza. Is that the one? Is bar on like Crown College Street? On Crown, College. No, Crown, no, Crown, Crown, Crown. Okay, yeah. It's on Crown. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was like just just heating up. Crown was just heating up when I left. Yeah, that because I I graduated in ninety two and bar was open just like a year then. So yeah, okay, so All you right. might you might yeah. So just Crown just was just switched. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, bake, mashed potato and bacon, man. That sounds, see, I feel like the thing about pizza, is, and, and that New Haven is like great for that because you have all different kinds, is that they're all good. Like yep. they're all fine. It's like wine. It's like they're all. I mean, you can like them all. You don't have to say, well, I prefer this, and I'm not. So that means the other stuff is bad. No, no, no. The other stuff's good too. Um, I mean, the Greek a Greek salad and a, a half a pepperoni pizza from York side. It's not like you're not you're not you're people happy. in in, Nap- in Naples will hate you, but. It's pretty good. Yeah. And then you could also get a, the meatball uh, sl- a sl- sub, which is like super, super New England thing. <laughs> totally. <Yeah. laughs> and lobster rolls, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Connecticut versus Maine. Right. They're all pretty good. They're all pretty good. I'm not going to say no to it. I'm not going to say no. I do like I like butter more than mayonnaise. Me I too. Think, Me but, too. But they're both good. Um, and then also, did you ever go to Louis Lunch? Louis Lunch. I did. I yeah. did. Louis Lunch was like. Uh, it, would, it was op- open intermittently, and it would close. The other one for like a few hours a day. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it would close, and then. But I've, I've I've since been back, and it seems like it's a little bit like they have uh, they have I get, I get they, they have begun to manage their brand. I think is the, is yeah. the way it's open more regularly and open a little later. The, the thing about Louis Lunch is that they just have decided to double down on this kind of not true thing that they invented the hamburger. Right. That's it's yeah. it's known as the birthplace of the hamburger. Yeah. It's not really. I don't. I don't think. I put it this way. It, that is an unproved. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's not a verifiable fact. Yeah, <clears throat> and they so they cook it in this brazier on both sides, and they put it on um, white bread on, on Pepperidge Farm oh. sandwich bread yep. with like cheese whizzy, with like like a kind of a spreadable cheese, and a, a slice of tomato and a slice of uh, onion, and it sounds weird. It's delicious, and you and it's the only way you can get it. There's no. It's yeah. not Burger King. It's not hold this. It's, yeah, it's get out. And there's no ketchup. No, exactly. No ketchup. And yes. right. if you ask for it, they kind of pretend like, ha, 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 it's funny that you're asking for it, um, but they don't think it's funny. <laughs> and so, but they used to have this, 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 uh, you know, a squeeze bottle of ketchup, like it was rigged. So um, it had a b- red string in it. So if you squeezed <laughs> it, this red string would shoot out like it was like a, str- oh, like, him, like, like a, like a thing of, of ketchup. <laughs> and if you really asked for it, the guy would say, here's some ketchup for you. And he would squeeze it. And you'd think that he was squirting ketchup on you. And it was sort of like you know when people are pretending that they think it's all really funny and they're really really mad. That's yeah. how they, it was not fun. It was like <laughs> it was it was not it was not genial. It was don't order ketchup. And then there's another place since we're talking about New Haven. Yeah, it was my favorite place in clothes was the uh, um, Yankee Doodle, which was a little counter, a counter about this a little bit bigger, maybe ten, maybe ten seats, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's it. Like a counter and stools, and then a wall really close to the stools. It was super narrow. And um, and that was just like its classic hot top hot top diner, um, where this one guy, the guy who owned it, had managed to run this gr- his grill or his griddle like, and it was so efficiently he could cook all sorts of different things. And everything was small, so he ordered one or two of everything, and um, <laughs> he would do this thing, which is the first time I ever saw it. Like you could go and you could say, "I'll have a, a pig in a blanket." For breakfast, or a pig in a blanket and scrambled eggs, and a, a grilled donut, mm. and he would take a fresh like cakey donut, you know, baked donut, and slice it like a bagel, and butter it, and then grill it, and you got it like a bagel on a little plate with like grape jelly. I mean, this is like you can only eat this when you're twenty. 
Because <laughs> even when you're 25, you start to like getting type two right from that. Exactly. Yeah. Heartburn. Right. Oh yeah. You know. But no, I I, I, that, I love that. There was a place when I lived out in California. They would griddle muffins. The same thing. Mm. Cut a blueberry muffin in half, so slather good. it butter, and it's got crispy bits oh, on it. Oh, so good. And then you can do all. You can like put some creme fraiche if you want it. Oh I mean, yeah, 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 you want it fancy. Yeah, you want yeah. it fancy. You know. <laughs> But it was one of those places where they would do the butter. But a donut a, slice yeah. in half, bro. It's a Ooh. big vat, and there would be a big old paddle, and they would like scoop and get a paddle of butter and stick it on the thing, and and like it was the kind of t- it was time. So this is nineteen. I graduated eighty seven, so this right. is in the late eighties, um, where uh, like no one, no one looked at, no one thought that was weird. Like now they be, oh my god, what's wrong? What happened <laughs> to you today? That this is what you're doing? Like what's wrong? Like, did someone, is everybody okay? Are you okay? Are you depressed? Well, I, I know. Yeah. I, I, you can't eat your feelings. Yeah. I'm like, I can. I, sure, I can. <laughs> My feelings are good. Exactly. exactly. I'm feeling sugar. good about what I'm about to eat. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that is what wine does, right? Uh, absolutely. You like, you like your food better. <laughs> so, um, after Yale, right to USA, like, you hop on a plane, go to USA? Uh, no, I, was... I spent a year teaching English in okay. my old school, and then... Uh, and then really it's just for no other reason than I just wasn't really ready to get in the car and go. And then I got in the car and went. And then I showed up in on Labor Day of 1988 and uh, just kind of like – now people do it. Like now young people – I mean I was in a class today at NYU and they're you know, these are all sophomores in college. Uh, and they know everything about show business. They're completely like – Hip. They know they're writing a script. There's some, some of them, this is their second script they've written or right. third. That's why they took the class. Oh, Rob Long, I'm going to take yeah, that class. Right, right. That's why they took right. that class. But last, like when I was there, like when I was in their position, I had no idea how to do any of this stuff. Nobody ever, no one told you that. Everybody was going to be a banker, um, mm-hmm. which I also didn't know how to do. Uh, but so, so, I, so it was kind of weird. You go out there and like I didn't, didn't know anything. So you go to school a little bit and, and it, was a, it was a good school, a bunch of good teachers and really good. Cla- you know, my class there, they were all, you know, they all want you to do great stuff. And so we all kind of help each other and support each other. And, and would, um, some, uh, one guy I know who, uh, wrote, um, you know, fun, funny indie movies, uh, just pulled me aside once and said, Hey, I met this person you should meet. Uh, someone does TV. Uh, uh, and I, I mean, like, you should, you should connect it. And that was kind of the way it was. It was really, very, very, very good. Like, I, I'm, I hope it still remains that way. Yeah. Cause that was kind of part of the fun of it was like, you know, Joining a tribe, right? Yeah, like exactly. a bunch of people. So you're same age, you're same moment in career. You're right. just starting out. It's kind of you know. It's very cool. You, you know, the, I think the word they call it, it's a cohort, but it wasn't a cohort. It was just like this is my crew. It's my friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, you know? right, right. Um, so, and then I have to ask this. I mean, did you do the classic Route 66 and you drive straight to the <laughs> Santa Monica Pier, or are you like no? No, I didn't. I didn't. I uh, well, kind of, I guess, because technically, I don't know how I did. I think we went. I was no, I was uh, on I uh, forty, I think, and I've since done it a bunch of times. I actually do like that drive, uh, and I guess at forty, at some point you hit Vegas or you're just yeah, below you, Vegas. At forty, you're going the northern, more northern yeah. route. Yeah, yeah, and then you go, and then you go up to Vegas because you're like, oh, I don't well, know, so I'm, I'm only three hours <laughs> from Las Vegas. Exactly. Yeah, uh, and then you then it's a long, it was a five hour it's drive, five drive down, down to L. A. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but I've since done it. And I was driving across like years and years ago with a friend of mine who grew up in Moss Point, Mississippi. And he was going home uh, for Thanksgiving. And so we got on the car in I – mean, I lived in Venice at the time. And I picked him up, and we got on uh, the 10. Which yep. is, because in, Cal- in L.A., you refer to all the freeways by the, the yep, 10, right. the 405, whatever. And we got on at the very end of the 10, which is the Santa Monica Pier. And then we just got on 10, and it just kept going. And then eventually, the Moss Point exit in Mississippi is off of the 10. So you just stay on the 10. You go – all the way through the desert, you go through Texas, you go through Louisiana, yep. and then you go through New Orleans, and then suddenly you're in Mississippi, then in the coast, and um, and then he got off. And I said, "Oh, you're exit 47 in Mississippi." Well, you know, we're, we're ne- we never got off. It was pretty cool. That was like you realize just how big the country is too, how big Texas is. Holy moly! Oh yeah, I did that once. Um, drove across the country, actually from Baja, drove up Baja oh, and whoa. across. Um, people don't realize the halfway point, little fun fact, the halfway point, if you're driving from the East Coast, uh, say like New York to California, the halfway point between uh, California is in Texas. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, you, like the, it's Texas. Is you're always in Texas. Huge. Yeah. Like, it's literally. 
The uh, you know the other state that's like that that people forget is Tennessee. So if you get on the oh yeah because we because we went, we went oh to Tennessee God. because yeah you, you, we went through Asheville and we're like shit I'm still in Tennessee you're still in Tennessee because it's got that weird shape goes out yeah Knoxville all the way to, to uh, Memphis yeah. it's like a that's like a big that's like it's ten hours yeah, yeah it's a hike it's like California on its side yeah. <laughs> it's weird <laughs> so um, were you looking for a job or you knew you were gonna go to school when you were out there so no I, ha- I was gonna go to film school so okay. like I figured like the better than a job is like to, oh hell you yeah know, yeah I don't have a job that's how I ended up with a law degree that I don't use but <laughs> yeah, I was like right, I don't right, need right. Right. what can I do what's easy the LSAT <laughs> oh, yeah that's, oh, wait, that's easy I did I had the LSAT um, prep book in um, uh, next to my bed I'll see. And I thought, you know, look, if I don't get something soon, I'll just do that. And I was so arrogant. I thought, oh, I'll just do that. Like, I have since looked at the LSAT. I mean, maybe I'm just too old, but look at it. Like, oh, I could never. I don't even well, I know. Think, I think. What I is think the Pythagorean? I mean, like, double. It's, it's like, all I, logic. It's like, you're like, there's like math on it and shit. You're like, what the hell? I don't know. I don't know shit. Yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> you made the right move. <laughs> yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um,. What was it like living in Southern California? Because you had lived in Northern California. You know, I, I mean, I liked it. I still, I was there for 30 years. Oh, wow. So I know people who um, hate it. But I didn't hate it. I thought it was great. It yeah. was great. It was like sunny and you lived at the I beach. I know, people, and, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. I mean, like, people talk about, this is something, and, and you've lived on both coasts and you live in New York now. I'm like, when I moved back 10 years ago, no, it's shit, 12 years ago. <clears throat> um, it's 2022. Yeah, see, yeah. Um, I was like, what, what are you talking about? Traffic's just as bad here. Everybody talks about like, how bad traffic in L.A. Yeah. And, and I'm like, oh, at, least, at least I'm looking at palm trees. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just feel like it's like the, the, the thing that I didn't like about L.A. were just because I had been there too long. And I'm sure if I had been in New York 30 well, years, I'd feel thing. the same thing. You know, like everybody's talking the same thing. Everybody, like, especially in L.A., there's, there's this one conversation. We know what it's about. It's about the mill. The mill. It's a mill town. Everybody right. talks about that business. Um and, you know, at a certain point, you get to be a certain age, and, like, if you're going to be challenged to, like, come up with new ideas and new stuff, you have to sort of change your environment a little bit. Um, and if you just do the same thing every day, which is not bad, like, I mean, you know, going to the same place for your coffee, walking in the same neighborhood. I lived in Venice. lived in Venice for <coughs> almost, you know, I mean, 25 years. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I knew my neighbors. It was a very neighborly place, but, like, it, there's a kind of, like, okay, something's got to change here, or I, I, I'm just, every day's the same. Um that's kind of the that's the only downside, but that's not because it's L.A. I mean, L.A. is like it's. I mean, by the way, now I think it's a very different city. Now it's incredibly interesting and diverse and crazy. And now I think you do go places, and no one you meet is in the entertainment business, and they're all still doing really interesting, cool things. Yeah. So there's a different. It's a. It's it's really really sort of come into its own just in time for me to leave. Or maybe <laughs> it required me to leave for it to go up. You were you were you yeah. were holding it up. Yep. Ah, uh, there, Rob. Um, what's that? There's a poem. I don't know. It's Bernstein, but it's like live live on the East Coast, but don't stay till you get too hard. Live on the West Coast, but don't stay till you get soft. So oh, that's yeah, that's a good idea. And and that's that's kind of what it is. Like you know, but I mean, you wake up on Christmas and it's 72 degrees. Yeah. And you're like, fuck the snow. It's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. When I first Christmas, I was like, I'm in a hot tub <laughs> on Christmas. Right. I remember <laughs> I was like coming back from here. Some like right around this time of year, like January, February, cold in New York. It was cold, and I said, like, land at night in LA. And I got into the taxi, and I'm going, going to my uh, take me to my house. And you go down a hill, you go down Lincoln um, Avenue from the marina uh, into the marina from the from LAX, and it's sort of a big, sk- and you kind of see the side, the see the, the the city, the lights of the city. Mm-hmm. And it's like middle of January, you roll down the window, and you can smell. The night blooming jasmine in a way, and it's like that's not bad. Mm-hmm. That's not. I just left, not like pretty winter tide, like crystal winter tide. You know, you leave. I left brown, black, slushy snow. It's wet. It's not pretty. Nothing looks good. And like, eh, you know. Yeah, snow's good while it's falling. Oh, it's beautiful. And then while I, it's then falling, I, then and I want to get and back in that taxi. Exactly, oh, right, yeah, right. Exactly. And then yeah. the day after, it's like, right. oh. Fido was here. You're right. That's and his, and his right. nasty ass owner didn't pick up after him. And at least that's frozen. I just think the, the, the general look of it is just this and it's just like <laughs> slush, slush, slush. Yeah. No. I mean, even like slush. I, but I say that now. I like it. I, I'm happy. I'm here. I love it here. Like, no. I'm still not over the fun of it, of the fact that I have all these sweaters I get to wear again. Right. That's the thing, right? Like, 
when you live in California, LA, like it'll be like sixty, and women are wearing fur coats because it's cold. Yeah, they're like, like they bring, they bring out their boots. Yeah, like they like they literally still wear the winter fashions, but it's oh, like God. sixty degrees. They're yeah, like, yeah, I mean, we have, people are sitting outside in New York because of COVID mostly, but sitting outside in 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 awful weather. With that one stupid heater that doesn't really do anything. And like, this is fun. This is fun. People in L.A. would just not stand for that. I mean, my <laughs> God. It's like you you have to sweat from the heat outside it, it, at night because the heater, they, they, they're they always yeah, they, fighting. They, they, turn they it have, up. Turn they have, it have up. those heaters, like you said, in like everywhere. Yeah. When I lived in Santa Barbara, we have the heaters. Oh, my God. Yeah. I was like, I was like, dude, it's, it's 65 it's degrees. Fine. What are you? Oh, I'm freezing. Oh, my God. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're but then you stay there for a while. Like, then after I was there yeah. for like six years, I was like, shit. And, I, and my joke was like, they're like, it's freezing. I'm like, no, freezing is 32 degrees. Okay, so let's stop saying it's freezing. Then it was like, it'd be like, oh my God, it's 58. So freezing. Let me raise my fleece. It's in the I, 50s. <laughs> exactly. That's right, yeah. It's horrifying. You're horrifying. <gasps> you know, I'm going to. And also when it rains, it's like, it's raining. I'm going to stay home today because it's raining. They need to stay it's home. Raining. You, you realize they don't know how to drive. They don't them. know how to drive. They it's freak like, out. It's like yeah. an inch of snow in Atlanta. Like literally. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I remember, dude, seeing I was this going down to 101. I was living in Santa Barbara. I was going to LA, and it's it's and it's pouring like when it never rains California, but it, it was pouring right. right. And somebody's going down to 101 like 80 miles an hour, and I'm like, they're gonna hydroplane, right? And sure as shit, this was I, I. And when you see stuff like this, it's like in slow motion. All of a sudden, the car just starts spinning. And, it, and like you, like it, it seems so slow. I was like, right. and, and my girl at the time, she just took her foot off the brake because it wasn't. You don't want to slam on the brake, right? And like, and then it spun around like five times, and then spun off the side. And they they didn't get hurt like as bad as they could have, but like the car. But I was oh. like, you just knew it was going to happen. I guarantee you, the inside of their pants got hurt. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I would not. Have, I would not have lasted See, for that. Like, yeah. And then uh, and another time, it's a crazy LA story because like people don't know how to drive in LA. I don't know what it is. Like I'm in Santa Monica. And we're at a light, you know, it's one, it's a, oh, I can't remember the intersection, but it's in Santa Monica. It's a pretty big one. We're about to turn on Lincoln or something. And like, there's, there's two lanes, each is four lanes, two each way, uh, two, two going this way. And like, you just hear, we're just kind of talking and you hear, you hear so much, uh, squirts on their brakes, right? Like, and then like, we look up and literally this freaking Jeep just goes, woof. Like it started flipping over. Holy moly! Landed on the tires. Oh. And the driver must have been high as fuck. Just popped out the window. I was like, only in yeah, L. That's right. That's right. Only. And in yet, LA. okay. And yet, I used to. I was doing a show and doing a production out on Long Island for a couple of years, and I never saw accidents, and I never saw driving as insane. Well, that I mean, they don't believe the in stopping LIE. distance. I mean, the LIE is. Ludicrous. Hundred mile, hundred miles an hour, crazy snow, uh, and then, and then it's not like, oh, well, they know how, how you do it because, like, not the one day went by that I didn't see right. a serious accident. It's not either. Minnesota where they yeah. actually know to drive in snow. Like, yeah, yeah. It's just like, oh, I got snow tires, or I have four wheel drive. No, maybe, you're an idiot. Maybe people are just dumb. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> That's it. People are just dumb no matter where you go. Well, you know, what did he say? Stupid is as stupid does, exactly right? right? So, with truer lines were written. So, um. UCLA, uh, your f- Cheers was your first gig? Yeah, it was my first job. The thing uh, is how that do you, how do you land? Well, like back then, it's like a little different because like TV, they ran out of material every day, right? Because somebody they did it and they needed more material, and um, well, shows like that have been going on. You know, I joined in the seventh season, I think. So it already had seven seasons and it was a successful show. And what they needed was they needed young blood, they needed new people, and so there there was. There was always a need for it, and you just had to figure out how to turn the dials so that you know you got open sesame, and um, and you know that's what going to film school did. So it taught me, okay, well here's what you do, you know you write a couple of spec scripts and then you send them to agents that you find out by copying down the names of uh, writers on shows that you like, and then you call the writers guild and they tell you who those agents are, and so now you know the name of this agent. This agent represents people who are roughly at my level, right? Uh, and you just kind of think of it that way. You just think of it like you don't try to overthink it. I still think that stuff works down too. If people want to break in, that is kind of how it works. Don't you're solving a problem for somebody. They want they don't not want you to be good. Everybody wants you to be good. Uh, you just have to make it easy for them. Um, and you know, every single one of those shows still today 
has a portion of the budget called the, the staff writer, which is a specific designation. It's not, you know, they're all writers on staff, but mm -hmm. the staff writer, like capital S, capital W, is like the lowest level writer. You don't get a screen credit. Uh, and yeah, I think you get paid. I think we got paid less than the assistants. Um, but you do, you know, you, you do a 10 week gig, and if you like, you'd be on another 10 weeks, and then another 10 weeks, and then you become a story editor, and then you work your way up. And the thing about Cheers was that all those people at the top, you know, they had already gone off to do their own things. And so there was, they, they needed to develop younger people to go and run the show eventually. And so we were there for a couple of years, and then we sort of run, ran the show with two other guys uh, the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like, you know, people go, oh, my God, you were running this big show. Like, you, you, you know, the show is running itself. I mean, all those actors and the, and the story, we, you knew what a Cheers episode was supposed to be. Um, and that's what we really were. Our, our job was to energetically kind of be lively with the show and take it in different directions and break the mold and to think fresh and to keep it renewed. Mm -hmm. um, and which we did, and we loved it. It was great. And then, you know, like I've never had an experience like that ever, ever since. I mean, not just the fact that it was successful, but just the people I worked with, the people I learned from, they were all really great. And they all still are remaining, they still really remain really, really great. Um, you know, I was like, maybe two years ago, I still had lunch with Ted Danson and Mary Steenburgen, who, who he wasn't married to then, and I didn't know, but, uh, and he was just great. Just like this, you know. Like, he's the nicest guy in the world. I've heard. I've heard oh, from nice, nice but also, guy. like, he's super smart, too. Like, he's nice, but he's also, like, he, you know, he's done it a long time. He's really good. So he understands why you want to have a good ensemble. He understands, like, wh how how this person at the top sets the tone. He has no e real ego, so he's perfectly happy to be a guest on your show or be a, a one of a large ensemble. Um, you know, he, he, you know, for actors, I would always say, just study him. Study what he is on screen, but also what he does not when he's when he's not on screen, because yeah, that that is a guide, you know. Mm, mm. Anyway, that so it was great. It was lo loads of fun. I mean, it's incredibly, you know, it was, it was it was that was the graduate school that I didn't go to. Right. So what was it like? What's it like being at like the Emmys or the Golden Globes, and you're sitting there and you got your tuxedo yeah. and you're nominated? What's what's that like, man? Well, you know, it's hard because you like you it, we we were I've been there three or four four times, um, and you kind of know. It w if it's your year or not, mm. and you kind of know, like, because it's all very kind of political, right? Um, and so you know when it's not your year, but when you think it's your definitely your year and you don't get it, you're like, well, that's ridiculous. That sucks. That's horrible. <laughs> and so there's these little, there are always little rivalries, you know, uh, these shows, like the staffs of one show will like, I don't know why anyone likes that show. <laughs> and they'll, like, it's usually the other show's perfectly good. Um, and I think when we joined the staff, like, the, for some reason, they decided they didn't like Murphy Brown, the show Murphy Brown, uh -oh. uh, which was a big hit that back yeah. then. It was a perfectly good show, yeah. and they uh, didn't like it. So, like that was the one you did, you're not supposed to like. Can you believe it? Uh, <laughs> that what they did last night, um, and I'm sure there are people who do that for us too. Uh, and then and then eventually those people would win Emmys. They would go, oh, I can't believe. Well, you know why they got the Emmy because of <laughs> blah, 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 something like that. Um, but the truth is that these 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 words now mean less. I mean, they, they mean less than anything. The weird thing about it is that they, Emmys mean less now because there's so many other ones. But the Golden Globes, mm -hmm. people, I mean, this is the, my dates me, he's an old timer. People think of the Golden Globes, they, they, they're they like, oh, the Golden Globes. Whereas when I was like it, right, like the Golden Globes are a total racket. I was like, are you kidding me? It's like eight Serbian dudes, like, who are running this thing. It's like a complete. <laughs> complete scam and like it's all the the fixes in it's not even it was not even when i started it was not even broadcast nationally it was just on channel five dick clark owned it and put ah. it on channel five people watch it nobody knew who's going to show up the only reason they got anybody to show up at all was that they gave there was free wine at the table see but cash bar well, cash bar see but wine this is this yeah. is why this yeah. podcast is I get people to bring wine. Yeah, no, no. this is this is open really nice. It's some, really, this is it's, really yeah, open up really nicely in the glass. Actually, it's. I'm going to be useless for my. Wouldn't have decanted uh, this one because this 7 is. Seven p.m. Uh, call, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Maybe I'll be really good for it. Yeah, actually, you'll be, you'd be, you'd be. No, it's really like it's nice. Like this is like the, this is my favorite Bordeaux. My sort of go-to, um, um, any Santa Steph. Uh, I, that's kind of what I like. It's, it's Let me not do some math. Too 98, 20, so this is 20 and 18, 24 years old. Yeah. Um, no, it's so good, right? color. It's beautiful. And, you know, and you got, it's like cherry leathery. Yeah. You know, the doo-doo's gone. 
Well, it always comes back. Yeah, you know it does. It always comes back to that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's like nice and tight too. Yeah, like you can kind of mm, has the tannins, as they say. Yes, yes. Um, but it's a little bit okay. I think I guess it's a, also a little bit soft and faded. So yeah, that, no, it, I like I like the plushness. It is. Yeah. It has a nice little soft mouthfeel to it. I mean, I would feel like my own like middle brow tastes. I mean, if I was eating, I would love it. If it's a little colder, I'd love it. Um, I love it, but it's like it's a uh, it probably. <clears throat> it's about five degrees too warm. Yeah, and um, this would go great with uh, what would you what would you pair with this? I would do like I just simple like like simple grilled meat, roasted meat, roast. Uh, I, I do chicken with this. I don't. I mean, I think actually, chicken it, with it, red it, white is delicious. I'm trying to remember what the but it's soft like a merlot, so you could yeah. totally do a chicken with it. Yeah, yeah. The thing about it is, I feel like it's either because uh, of the my the 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 year or two of like not the perfect storage. But that doesn't really change I don't, it. I mean, I'm looking at your cork. I'm looking yeah. at the color on it. I mean, I did use the Duran just because I didn't want to mess it up, and I almost and I didn't. Looks pretty it. good, actually. It looks very good. Yeah. So you did a good job. Um, I just feel like it. It. it um, it's not quite as the quite quite the extract the extracted flavor I like. Yeah. And that could just be because Santa Staff is a little mellower. It is. Um, when you get a when you get a Bordeaux that that has that California extraction and it's like only thirteen five like holy shit then you get wine yeah. like I got wine when I first time I had a, 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 a eighty six Mouton I was like this yeah. is from France whoa yeah this tastes like it's from Saint Helena it's exactly yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and you love that and that's why they bought mm-hmm. up all this land in Napa because you know yeah and they who can doesn't do who doesn't like yeah and they could do nice stuff to it like you know in Napa you can do wine. stuff. You can irrigate. You can, you know, play around. Like the, the, border, the border rules are really strict. But, but I have a friend who's, like, super aristocratic Frenchman um, whose name is, like, the most French name ever, Hubert. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, he's, like, fam- you know, old family, and um, they go hunting all the time. And uh, he was, like, he once turned to me and said, uh, Je suis très saint Estef moi, which means I am very saint Estef. It's, like, which a weird thing to say. But... What he meant was like his. That's him. Like that. That's old France. Like not showy. We're not. It's not fancy. I mean, it's fancy, but it's not like oh, Mouton or something or Petrus or something. No, no. This is like for you know respectable aristocratic thing. And I, you know, can kind of taste that's good. Yeah, and I remember when I first got in the wine business in '97, the garage east were coming up, right? Mm-hmm. So, so even you know, Petrus is you know. The most expensive Merlot in the world, but like then there were guys who were like, we're we're not really gonna kind of find your rules, right? And they they and they was like garagist. They made the wine in the garage, but right. they were getting hundred points from Parker and they're like, good wine, and too. they were good. They were like, I was like, damn, they weren't messing around with like all this earthiness. I read this great <laughs> story, and I can't, I'm not, I'm not prepared, so I could, I don't know the names of these varietals, but so a French, a young French, nerdy uh, agriculture s- graduate student. Mm-hmm. Uh, is like hiking, you know, he's probably one of those like really irritating, you know, you've seen these really irritating people we have here, like, but he's hiking around in his little shorts and his backpack, you know, <laughs> like he, ugh, like a little nerd, and uh, and he sees in a little copse, like a little like area, like four trees or something, this grapevine, mm-hmm. and I think he's like in, uh, he's not quite on the West Coast, so he's not like in, in Bordeaux, he's maybe in the south of, of the Burgundy, or maybe just, just, just uh, west of Burgundy. And uh, and he sees a little grapevine, and he goes and goes, oh, I gotta check this the grapes out, which he didn't couldn't identify, and so he took some samples and he went back and he like identified it. It's like it's a it's a varietal that doesn't exist. It has not been a varietal for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. There are uh, um, accounts of that wine, but there's no there are no grapes because of course they did, you know as everybody does they sort of focused on the things that were selling, and then he decided he was going to look for all the other weird little varietals in France, and they're doing it of course everywhere else. Right. But they in France they tend to be a little bit more like no this is what we, we know what we're doing, but I guess the French government decided no we got to like branch out so they funded this huge plan, and I think we're like ten years away from getting these incredibly mind blowing crazy old, uh, like tastes from uh, many years ago wines from France and that'd be that's gonna be awesome yeah um it's climate change so they've they've been adapting yeah know? I guess yeah right right <laughs> you know they're they're growing um playing with Albarino now in Bordeaux you can. <laughs> really? Wow. Uh, uh, Tempranillo, Tintacao, they're they're playing with some derivatives. That's because, great. Yeah, because you know great. it kills them. Yeah, it does kill them. You know, we got to take a quick break, Rob. Uh, we'll be right back in a second. Okay, we're back with Rob Long, and um, 
yeah, it's a great conversation. He not only is a great writer, but he's a great conversationalist. Oh, you can tell. You. you can tell. Um, so <clears throat> after Cheers, you did like Big Wave Dave, Good Company, George bunch and Leo, a bunch of them. Uh, any any. Thing notable that stands out, like you said earlier, Cheers was like grad school you didn't go to, but anything right. you learned during that time period? Of well, I mean, career? look, like, what you learn is that you have uh, shows that are on, shows that are off, and you have shows that work and shows that don't, and you have shows that fi find you know uh, twenty million viewers, but that was when they needed twenty five million, or uh, twelve million when they needed thirteen million. Um, but you also redefine success as like, did we have fun? Did we do two seasons or three seasons or four seasons of a show? Uh, it did was the cast was it with casting right was did did, did did we luck out like it's lightning in a bottle and so some of them you like you you you, you care about all of them because you have to care about it to do it mm -hmm. uh, and then when you're in the middle of something it's like childbirth they always say like the minute this painful childbirth experience is over some hormonal thing happens to the women who give birth that they forget how painful it was true. <laughs> yep, there you go. And they're like, oh yeah, I'll yeah, go right yeah, back and do yeah, it. And you're yeah. like, well, you were just screaming <laughs> uh, obscenities, <laughs> and like, and 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 and, and just to, just to forget. And I think because you have to love it to do it three and times, three. Holy moly! Oh my god! Wow, good three. For you. Damn, good. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. So it's like, like like you love it, and so but then in uh, in the uh, as time change passes, you can look back and say, okay. Okay, this one, this show we did got canceled, and you know what? It, it I get it. Yeah, it, it yeah. hadn't worked. Yeah, yeah. And this other one, uh, this was a good one, and this was perfect, and this is what just what we wanted to do. So, and that, I mean, I've had experience where I've done pilots where I thought, okay, this, this is gonna be great, and then you see it later, you're like, well, what did I do? What, what's, and it's, it's, what's missing is it's not something a mistake that you made. Um, it could just be it, look, these things are like magic, and that. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Look, uh, they did the Frasier pilot. I was there for that, um, and uh, Lisa Kudrow was in it, the pilot, and she played uh, basically who the part that Perry Gilpin ended up playing, Roz. Yeah, okay. And uh, she was there for the first week, uh, the first couple of days, and they all decided, oh, you know, best we, thing happened to her. Yeah, yeah Lisa <laughs> she Kudrow. Went to yeah, right. She's not. She's not right. She wasn't Roz. So they uh, they fired her, and uh, she was very good friends with a friend of mine, and she just sat. She came over to their house, and she sat on their living room floor, and she cried and cried and cried and said, I'm out. I'm done. I do not want to do this anymore. Why would I want to do this? Um, I'm going home. And they convinced her to just one more year. And a year later, she was in France. Yeah. But the, the thing about it is like, okay, maybe you, maybe you uh, I don't know, if I had Lisa if, if I was doing a pilot and Lisa it was, had been my decision, I would have said, well, Lisa Kudrow is really great and funny, and you have her, so why don't you change the part? So that she can do it and mm -hmm. just alter it for mm -hmm. Lisa Kudrow because she's so good. That's kind of what I would have said. Mm -hmm. But then that would have like think of the sliding doors thing. That would have a ripple effect on what Imagine Friends without Lisa Kudrow. Like, would it have worked? Wow. It's it's you don't know. So wow. all these weird serendipitous things. It's like show business. You just can't tell. That's crazy. I'm, thanks for sharing. That's 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 interesting because it's so true, right? Like, because you know Fraser and Niles and they were snooty and right. like, Roz. Not being snooty, but being British, you know, kind of. Anyway, that's kind and, of. And Fraser's dad, the great actor John Mahoney, yeah. um, it, he had never ever wanted to do TV, never wanted to do comedy. He just thought it was dumb. He was a stage actor, and he was really good. And we did, the year before, the last year of Cheers, we did an episode, and, uh, and we had an older character, older guy. He was a guest star, and he played like an old ad salesman, old ad writer, like an old jingle writer. And um, we had a guy, an older actor, play the part for the whole week, and then we were going to shoot the shoot night. Um, he just had, like, this weird anxiety panic attack, and he just drove home. And we were like, oh, that's not good, because now we can't shoot the show. And and so we needed to replace that part. So uh, the casting director, who's uh, um, this incredibly just brilliant, um, our casting director was just great, Jeff Goldberg, he, um, he said, well, look, I'm going to call John Mahoney, who I had seen on Broadway in House of Blue Leaves. He says, I'm going to call him. He probably won't do it because he just hates this stuff. But, you know, we're going to pay him a lot of money because we really need him. And, you know, it's cheers. He'll, he might do it. So Mahoney says yes. He comes out. Never done half hour before. And uh, stands there. And, uh, you know, we have a great week. He's like, he's John Mahoney. He's like, he's so great. And he, like, was super respectful during the whole pro the rehearsal process, which I, we always loved. But he'd like, oh, I, I mean, let me do this one more time. So I, I did it wrong. Like, well, actually, it was pretty good. Like, whatever. He, he's great. Um, and the end, like, the audience loved him, and I'm standing next to him. And I was, hey, would you ever do this? Would you ever come and do this? He goes, ah, no, I probably, well, I mean, it was something like this. Hmm. And uh, a year later, he's Frazier's dad. 
Um, now, the guys who created Frasier saw him on the sh- series, saw him on the show, mm-hmm. uh, and they knew, and the same, by the way, the same casting director, uh, and they knew that he was technically interested. He wasn't going to say no. So all those things just like, that's just, what if he had said, yeah, you know, I didn't really like the the hotel. <laughs> I prefer, I don't know, I, I don't like, we broke the seal on it. So he, he thought, okay, I'll do, I can do what I did at Cheers on this sh- new show called Frasier 22 times, 26 times. I guess we do 26 episodes a year. And um, before you knew it, there he was. Yeah. Wow. So this is like, it's weird, you know. Would it have worked with somebody else? Maybe. I don't know. People don't. I, that's what we like. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So it's so cool. Um, <clears throat> let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so you, you've had a lot of writing opportunities. Uh, clearly a prolific writer. Um, contributor to the National Review um, since 1993. Yeah. So that's like just six years out of school. And you're working in Hollywood. I mean, that's amazing. Um you have published three books, Conversations with My Agent. I'm have to get these s- set up, joke set up, joke. And and uh, bigly, Donald Trump in verse, yeah. which sounds quite funny. Talk about the inspiration behind that last book. Well, the last one, like a, f- a friend of mine runs a big publishing company and called me up. He thought, because like, Trump's kind of funny, and he says weird stuff. And if you look at his speeches, they seem like they're weird kind of n- like modern poetry in a way. And uh, – <laughs> So, um, so I thought, well, let me think about that. So, if you, if, and if you, and the rule was that you can a, anything he said had to be in the order he said it. Yeah. Uh, and we couldn't editorialize; it had to be like what he said. And um, and it seemed kind of funny at a certain point. It was kind of funny, like it actually kind of worked. And then we added like little editor's notes to it to make it seem like it was a real scholarly work, like a scholarly <laughs> effort on him. And the the only problem with the book was that the people who Hated Trump, of which there were many, um, and um, which I'm, you know, I have a, <laughs> I'm definitely part of that group. Uh, they just thought he's just too awful to make fun of. You can't make fun of somebody that terrible. Uh, and I think the New Yorker magazine like took me to task and said I was I was guilty of something they called jocular sanctioning, which I really just didn't even know wow. what that meant. <clears throat> which means that you're not allowed to make fun of somebody who's, who's just so beyond bad. the pale. Yeah. And my point, my rule is like, no, that you're allowed to make fun of anybody all the time. And actually, making fun of people is sort of like what you I mean. I kept saying to some my friend of mine who was who believed in the jocular sanctioning things, like, well, he is the president. He won. So. Nothing you do is going to re- change that for another four years. So, what are you going to do? You're going to have to make fun of him. That's all you. you that's what. That's the power Isn't you have. What, is, right. I mean, but that's what comedians do. Right. No matter who right. the president is, he's going to get roasted. Right. Right. Uh, and this one was like, oh my god, you can't roast him. And uh, and then the people who love Trump thought, how dare you make fun yeah. of this man? He is a great poet. This is the Messiah. He is, is a great poet. The Messiah. Uh, and so they were the so the people who hated him. Hated the book, and the people who loved him hated the book. So the result was that nobody bought yeah, the book. Yeah, he's so polarizing that yeah. people are like, I'm not gonna. Uh. Yeah, yeah, it has to be. It's just, are you making fun? I, mean, I think I did a talk radio <laughs> thing when the book was published. Are you making fun of the president? I'm like, yes, I am. Like, I, like, I'm not a lot. Who are you, people? Like, yeah, I mean, you can make fun of the president, even the one you like. Jimmy Carter, the, the peanut jokes. Yeah, I mean, it's just on and on and on. Right. Like I mean, even a popular one, you can make yeah, fun of. Yeah, I mean, people made fun of Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah, you know, but people made fun of Barack Obama because he was kind of full of himself. Yeah. <laughs> and he, it, 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 it wasn't funny jokes because they was true. And he, he kind of looked like Alfred E. Newman yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's got... And super uptight. <laughs> like Obama's like super uptight. He would eat apparently every night his snack. This is weird. This is weird stuff. Six almonds, not seven almonds, and not five almonds. Six almonds and two Newports. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, there was a lot of that. I, you know, I, we, I, I wish love we, him, but I'm going to make fun of him. <laughs> yeah, right. He smoked Newport. So those are ghetto-ass cigarettes, bro. Really? Newport is, yo, ugh. There's a great, oh. uh, I think it was near the end, maybe it was last year. Newports are so bad, the, the police might kill you for selling loose. That's all I'm going to say about Really? It. <laughs> See, I made a joke. People are yeah. like, oh, he oh, made you can't make a joke about that. joke like that. He was selling Lucy's and he, they were Newports. There's no doubt in my mind. Really? Or Cools. Well, Cools, I yeah, Cools, I agree. Cools from the seventies. Yeah. Newports came on in the eighties. Wow. <laughs> Did you smoke? Only in law school. Oh, well, oh I started. I started in law school, and then I smoked for like eight years, and I quit after I got out. But yeah. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. yeah. Like my girlfriend smoked, which means I had to smoke because I was going to kiss her. So. Right. You're smoking anyway. Yeah. Uh. Uh. 
there was a great la- a video that um, Obama did, I think it was last year, his last year, w- with uh, John Boehner, who was the f- then, that had been the Speaker of the House and then was out by that time. And it's really just funny. It's just Boehner, like, just making fun of him, saying, uh, I-, I can do everything and you, can- and you can't. <laughs> and Boehner, of course, was a famous smoker, and he sort of lit up a cigarette and smoked it, like, in front of Obama and said, I can do this. You can't. <laughs> it was so great. And Obama was looking at it, like, I just, oh, I cannot wait to be out of this exactly. office so I can stand in my backyard like a person. Exactly. And have a cigarette, like a grown-up man, <laughs> like a like I don't you know I don't smoke I smoke a cigar every now and then, but um I see I don't know this is like probably off topic, but I see it's all topic yeah here. great it's all I topic. see people vaping yeah, and I'm like just smoke a cigarette yeah no I'm like I, I appreciate when I see this is down fucked up but I appreciate when I see someone who I know is clearly in their twenties smoking a cigarette I'm like, yeah. You know what? You're cool. Take that's why people start smoking because we think it's cool. Yeah, exactly. Because it is. All right. <laughs> it is cool. It'll kill you, but it is fucking cool. Yeah, right. No, that's really true. Like you know, so don't, like vaping's not cool, but if you're 20, you like you go buy a pack and you pack it down. Oh the whole yeah, ritual. all that. Oh yeah, I and love that. And you see that. a young person with the with remember people with the zippo and they mm-hmm. flip it. It was cool as shit. And now it's like, oh, can I? I just plug. Yeah, you exactly. Yeah, right, you can smart. I just plug my thing into your USB yeah, port to, to charge, charge the, the USB computer. port? So I can go vape. It's a, it's apple cinnamon flavor. Like, oh my god, come on! And I'm like, and then those cheap vaporizers, they put out more smoke uh, than a cigarette. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Just smoke a cigarette, and then quit. You know? Exactly, then quit. Man, up, but you're right. Quit. It was the, it's the, and I think, but, but just to bring it back to this topic, right? I think it's also the thing that some people get obsessed with about wine is the stuff around it yeah. and all the fancy pants, but. Like there was something great about the this the process of like the tapping the cigarette and playing around. Yeah, yeah. I mean there's I mean there's there's rituals that go with certain yeah. things and and they're all cool. Now <laughs> let's this with switch gears again. Uh, fast forward to um, you now have this thing called the Ricochet Podcast Network. So like you're not messing around. Like you've done TV, you write books, you write political commentary, you 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 do. Um, uh, uh, I don't want to say charity, humanitarian work. You know, you give back. Sure, sure. Um, and then, like, how'd you get into podcast network? Well, like, I just feel, I mean, uh, uh, we were trying to launch this website one, uh, years and years ago, and a friend of mine said, well, you know, you should do what these guys did who launched a website called Gadget, GDGT. And they, as they were launching it, they they started a podcast. This is like 2008, 2009. Mm-hmm. So this is like kind of before podcast. Podcast it, broke. I remember I was going to start a podcast in 2003 when I first heard about it, but yeah. I didn't. And then they they kind of faded like no one like no one got it and then oh wait they started becoming I think like Tim Ferriss started there's certain people yeah, started this right like Rogan started in 09. so it was yeah. a renaissance after like this four or five year period of, of dormancy and they so weren't like they weren't they weren't big audiences but they, you could build a bunch of people would listen to you and then they would then, so when you're launching a product they would like they would go and try it and that's what we started doing just a conversation and um, and then other people wanted to join in other people want to have their own. And we found it was really easy to do, ask interesting people to do one, um, and uh, and I think it was right around the time that you know tr- uh, we were everyone was time shifting their TV, so people were like streaming more or even TiVoing like you know in the old days, so no one really believed in the schedule anymore except for the a certain group of people who had to commute. So people were commuting to work every day, and I was on public radio in LA, so I know like okay. in the morning they were listening to the news, in the evening on the way home they were li- either listening to the news. Uh, or sports radio, uh, and that was huge. And then just gradually, that terrestrial radio kind of faded away because people were like, "Well, I have my phone in my car. I'm going to listen to a podcast." Mm-hmm. And places like um, like uh, National Public Radio discovered that they, uh, I think they were kind of like cowardly, but they have a couple great titles that were huge on podcasts. So 2008 mm-hmm. financial collapse. Uh, um, uh, Alex Kestenbaum and um, Adam Davison start this thing called um, Planet Money, which is a podcast still there. Now, Planet Money was designed to be a, a, a radio show, but the powers that be at public radio, I, from what I understand, were like, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. What is this? And so they just decided to make it a podcast and kind of created a whole podcast category. Mm. Um, and so, I, you know, that, it's, it's an interesting – and as you know, like, like we, we're having a conversation now. And people are listening that they couldn't get anywhere else, right? Because we would be interrupted nine times or whatever, you know. Like th- there is a hunger for people when they're doing something else, right? Driving, walking, whatever, to listen to conversations, um, which they 
which is not the same as video because video is very bossy. You got to right. sit and watch video. Right. You can't we shoot drive. video, which I upload only season one, um, which I got to get on YouTube. But the, the beauty, like you said, it's, it's audio, right? So it's um, <clears throat> hands, busy, mind, free time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Walking on the treadmill, my right. wife listens to podcasts. She doesn't listen to mine, but um, <laughs> she's got you for free. Anyway, yeah, exactly. So exactly, for. she's got it for free. Yeah, and she doesn't think I'm funny or interesting at all. That's not true. I mean, she doesn't think I'm funny. She doesn't think I'm interesting. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but she can turn and ask you for free anything she wants. She doesn't have to like. Right, but like, where else am I going to hear a conversation between me and you? Right, right. Uh, right. Like, but here, and that's the beauty of podcasts, right? Um, Four to five million downloads a month, like you've grown this, so you must have some very interesting people on your network. Right? Yeah, or you know, or just you have an audience out there, and yeah. they just uh, you know, once you find an audience, you just serve them. Yeah, and uh, they kind of tell you what's good. The great thing about podcasts is when you when they fail, they they fail for free. It's not like a TV show. Right. TV show, and I've had a you know a one season of a TV show is like fifty million dollars, right. and it doesn't work. It's like okay, well that's fifty million dollars. Try something else. A podcast is like oh you know well. Try something else. Yeah, it's become the way. Have you seen this? Because I've seen this with my production team, because they've all worked in TV. That podcasts are a way to uh, do your pilots cheaper. Yeah. You, you know, you do your concept on. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. and then uh, uh, what was one of the podcasts? Uh, a lot of the crime ones. Yeah, all the, the crime ones are big. Yeah, yeah. Are huge. Although I hear people doing it for like scripted stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. People are actually doing the radio scripted. Drama, like yeah. you go on backstage and they're like looking for people. Right. To do a role for a podcast, and so they can go pitch yeah. it, right? They're like this had this many viewers, and you know this is the yeah, plot, and right. it, it only costs us a fraction to do it. And you know, oh, that's the story. I get it. Yeah, um, but you have started your own weekly podcast. Um, now we're here drinking a beautiful bottle of Santa stuff. Yeah, that's opening up. It's nicely. really, really good. Yeah, we'll um, finish it though before it's it, it, yeah, we will. We'll, that's like, that's yeah. life. Yeah, um, martini Tr shot. Yeah. Um, what is the, the concept behind Martini well, Shot? Well, Martini Shot is like an old show business um, uh, name for the last shot of the day. So the last shot of the day is called a Martini Shot because when you're done, you get to have your martini. Uh, and there's one the shot before the Martini Shot, just to do, do for show business lore, is called the Abbey Singer. Because years ago, there was a first AD, first assistant director, who called or named Abbey Singer, and he called the Martini Shot but he was wrong. There was one more shot left. Uh, that's and so they clowned him. Like, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they're mad at him because like everyone's like, "Oh, this is a martini shot. It's great." And then they had to go, oh, "I'm sorry, no, actually, uh, we have one more." Don't break. And they're like, you know, this is like, you know, uh, uh, so I started doing it on, on on the local public radio station in like a KCRW, and it was a four minute commentary. KCR, he just said that KCRW is iconic. Yeah, LA. yeah, yeah, right. I love that station. Yeah, it was it's great. Like, yeah. Um, and so I would do this four minute commentary. I would just tell stories. And originally they wanted me to like do <laughs> so funny. It's not the kind of handmade radio. Um, they wanted me to do uh, uh, like roundup of new uh, entertainment industry news. And I was like, I'm not doing that. That sounds like hard work. Why don't I just go and tell funny little stories about show business? There you go. And so I did like four of them. And they went, okay, all right, I, we see what you're doing. So I just did those for, I did them for 16 years. Damn. Um, and uh, and now and then then you know it was like I mean, it was it was, the, it was COVID and I was living here and I don't know there was also kind of a sense I think from them that sixteen years is a long time for one person to own four minutes of our radio that's a lot that's a lot uh, it was time to go somewhere else and, <laughs> and, so I don't really know who I don't think anybody replaced me not certainly not doing that but they kind of reshuffled everything and I was like well I still want to do it so I'm I'm just podcasting it I'm basically doing just what I did. Just four minute little stories, and some of them are uh, a little inside baseball, and some of them are not at all. What's what's one of your funniest inside stories that you have that you'll share with us? Well, I mean, they all a lot of them come from my book, or or, or, or inspired by the book, which is really just about this is the one with your agent, or yeah, Seth, the, the, okay. yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Uh, the, uh, those are both are pretty much the same book, by the way. Uh, it's kind of a rip off. You had to buy a book together. That's what we discovered. We discovered it's a package um, deal. Yeah, it's a package deal. Um, uh, mostly, I mean, mostly it's just like with stuff that happens. Like you'll have an idea, and then it'll go somewhere else, or uh, you know, you'll you'll learn. I mean, I, I, I there's one a story I always tell, which is when um, when I first started working uh, at Paramount, I was like, you know, you're a staff writer, so we're kind of low on the totem pole. We didn't park on the lot; we parked at the parking structure across the street because we weren't at a certain level. But we were kind of status level high, so we didn't have to start work until about ten thirty. So we came to the, we came to work later than anyone else, mm. and so all the sort of what they call below the line people, the you know, 
tech people and all that stuff, and construction workers and all those people. Um, they had they came in much earlier, but that meant that they got to park on the first, second, third, fourth gotcha. floor, and we had to park on the fifth floor, which meant I had to walk all the way down. But it was a like, cooler because I was like, well, I mean, I came in ten thirty, man. Yeah, I mean, I'm raised, I, reason I, when I wanted. I would really park on the eighth floor to come in. At yeah, 10:30. right. <laughs> So uh, what I discovered is you I walked down every day, every single day, there was an old DeLorean, which is an old car, like a kind of a a very cool car for Google like six it, minutes. Yeah. Watch Back yeah. to the Future. Yeah, Back to the Future. But, the but, future but actually, there's a documentary. It's a crazy yeah. car. It's a crazy story. John DeLorean was, a, was literally a gangster. <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy story. And there's this old dusty DeLorean there. Uh, and then it's so 1990, so the, the car itself was like 12 years old. Um, but it was the kind of car that you would buy when you first in LA, especially when you first had money. Right. And so whoever bought that car had money that one year. That the Doreans are big. And I so and we went and we checked his license plate, and his license plate was Alf A L F Writer R I T R. So his guy wrote Alf. His guy wrote for Alf for yeah, Alf for I think. Alf. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he got some money writing for the show, t- uh, the sitcom called Alf, which is about a, a, a kind of a Muppet alien. Yeah, it was a Muppet alien. Um, and, and then he said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to hit it big, so I'm going to buy a DeLorean because I am a big shot. But then, you know, stuff happens in show business, and, like, he didn't quite – he was, like, on level – he was on the second f- level, which meant he had to get in early. <laughs> so whatever he was doing, it was not at that level. And I just always – and it was a really good – it's really good when you're starting out. To walk down the stairs and see the DeLorean with Alf Ryder there, and realize, okay, you just and you the, just learn to love your had Subaru. Had the vanity plate, man. Yeah, the vanity like, plate. Like, yeah, yeah. He should have yeah. ditched the vanity plate at some point. Yeah. Just turn it in. Just yeah. give me like, you know, AE one, two, three, four. Right. But these are these are good lessons. Like, you, there's lessons everywhere. You just gotta look for them. <laughs> Alf Ryder. Alf Ryder. Not even like. Yeah, no, it was A L F W. R T R. No, I think it was just A L F space R I T R. It wasn't even, you know. Didn't even get the W in there. I don't think he could have. Well, maybe he could have. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to think how many Vanny plates. Anyway, I, I digress. We're talking about Vanny plates. Um, I just want to, this just popped in my head. Reality TV as a actual TV writer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, it, it kind of pushed everything aside for a while. Um, because it's cheap. I, I think there was a period where no one would ever do it because they just wouldn't imagine that actual people would debase themselves and humiliate themselves quite the way they do on reality TV. And then, I mean, it's one thing, I think, the competition shows I sort of get, like Survivor, I get it. Like, you're, you gotta survive. Like, uh, the cooking shows, I get that. You're gonna cook. The ones where they just follow you around while you scream at your fake friends at in restaurants... <laughs> I, and and like, to, that's weird to me. That's like, that's I think a little bit like um, they find these ambulatory psychotics, like people who are really not well, and um, put them on TV. Yeah, I mean, I watched this thing on Vice about the dark side of the '90s, and you know Jerry Springer is kind of like the father of reality TV. Like, right. just get people right. to act like a fucking fool on TV. Right. Right. And like you said, like I'm, when I walk into the studio, there's like the ultimate girls trip. So they're taking all these, all the crazy women from the Real Housewives, and they're taking them on a vacation together. That's gonna be a hoot. What's that? Like, why, why, <laughs> why would you ever? Why would you want to be within 100 miles of that? And, and the idea is like, why would you ever do that? Like, why they come to you and say, "Listen, we want you to be on the Real Housewives of whatever." I don't give a shit. You know, it's going to be horrible. The answer is no. Right. I would be actually insulted. Right. Like, right. what kind of person do you think I am? Right. Like, I'll, I'll right. let you do that right. to me? Right. Right. No way. <laughs> and like, they're always like throwing wine at each other. Have exactly. you noticed that? They're always yes. like, yep. "How dare you're, you throwing the, wine?" Like, exactly. Like, like some '40s cliche, like throwing right. the wine, a glass of wine in your face. I'm also and... drinking a lot of wine too. Oh, they're lit. Yeah. And they got and and they got. Drugs like they're on, oh, tranquilly Oh, it's they're, like, like you could yeah. tell they're there. It's, I just don't understand how you why. And no, but they're so immensely popular, it's crazy. If you walk, uh, like the uh, uh, the little the bodega area where I get uh, sometimes get my lottery tickets and my cigars because I sell them on Sixth Avenue, um, there's like a wall and it's the it's like People magazine and the other celebrity magazine, and the I don't know any of the people, all the people on the cover are not. 
famous for anything other no, than they I know. were just like, I know. well, Brandon is marrying Denisa from the thing. I'm like, I don't know who. What are they like? Right. They're just on a reality show about themselves. Yeah, I am amazed. Like, I look at the content. Darcy and Stacy, two crazy chicks from Middletown, Connecticut. I'm like, why do they have a show? Man? They have a show. Yeah. They have a show. And it's a little, I don't know. Like the 90 I'm, Day Life, that little guy with no neck who's like trying to date. And they're yeah. all uh, like, and then, and, and, and there's more of them because there's all these streaming networks that have to right. be on yeah, Twitter. It's cheap. So you, so you just got to like, oh, what, we gotta, what can we do for program? What can we do for program? What's cheap? What can we yeah. do? And then, like, that's the, 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 the two sisters or brother and sister, or not a brother and sister, two sisters or mother and sister, and they're like 9,000 pounds. Yeah, like my my nine thousand pound life. That's I'm, what it is. They I mean, I'm, or nine it's, thousand or it's, or it's, or it's like my thousand pound life, or the two. But I'm like, first of all, w- are we helping these people? This is this is sad. Like, right. you you can't make fun of a president, but you can parade people who have illness, mental illness, and and actually debilitating um, obesity, and, yeah. and we can that's entertainment. Yeah, and it's all like oh, it's mm-hmm. always like cloaked in this horrible thing. Like, well, no, it's really therapy. Right. Yeah, there's a doctor. Like, right. I don't right. know. It sounds yeah. ex- exploitative, right. like exactly. carnival You stuff. don't get, first of all, no one fucking ever gets fixed. It's <laughs> definitely not going to happen in one season. Yeah. They're going to have it on TV, <laughs> yeah. that's for sure. Because they cried. Yeah. I, my mother beat me. Right. Take stock. Well, my mom beat me. I'm fine. <laughs> Although you do get a sense, like, just how much crazy there is. I mean, uh, I used to watch the hoarder shows. The hoarders. Oh, those are Because those terrifying. are sort of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also kind of like you can tell this little map of the human brain they're building, you know, building a little tomb for themselves. Right. Uh, and um, there's always that moment where they go, okay, we're going to come and clean this out, right? You're okay with that. And they go, yes, I'm fine. I can't wait. I want to be free. And then, like, within five minutes of taking their stuff and dragging it on the lawn, they're freaking out. Like, right. no, you can't take – those are my plastic bags. <laughs> like, all right. You know, and I, that's I, that's also part of the the, the exercise I, I, of drinking I, I the wine. I cleaned wine. all those used straws. Yeah, right. They're right. sterilized. No, I might need it, those. <laughs> yeah. But that is kind of the thing you do when you when you start saving wine. Is you're like, okay, I gotta have, I gotta keep well, this. Well, yeah, like I'm like, I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm like, I'm like, it's Tuesday, it's Turley Tuesday, it's Turtle. I'm like, oh, well, yeah. that's good. That's a good Tuesday, exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about wine. Like, when did you start getting into wine? And like, what, what, like, when did you start developing your your taste for wine and your collection for wine? Well, I started like you know, like my parents drank wine okay. at every meal, and we were in Europe. I drank. I mean, I was too young, but everyone was drinking wine, and there was a ritual too, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and then we moved to Northern California as a family. There was like there was also now there was wine country. Yep. So that was a thing that people did, uh, and it wasn't quite the way it is now. It was much more sort of low key. But there were winemakers like Jack Cakebread yep. was a who, fine winemaker. Uh, I think the late Jack Cakebread. I think. Um, uh, was a car mechanic in Oakland. He uh, like fixed, you know, English cars. Yeah. Uh, and so everybody had a kind, you know, Warren Wernarski from Stag's Leap. He mm-hmm. was a uh, uh, philosophy professor at the University right. of Chicago. Like they're all like these are all people who were like Montalena. He was a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all had <laughs> other things going on, right? And, and 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 like they were like those some of those like unless they were a farmer family, they were like shit. I, I don't know if I can afford to keep right, doing this. Right, right, right. Like they were like. Pioneers. Yeah, and you got to pay rent on everything, right. so you got to pay, right? So, um, so that's kind of when I started drinking California wine. Okay. And then in college, uh, you know, you start like drinking wine because uh, if you, it's cheaper in a lot of ways, some ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, we discovered white Zinfandel, which was delicious. In defense of yeah. white Zinfandel, was delicious because you seem classier with the girls. And. Those Colorossi, that hearty Burgundy. Oh yeah, that was like that Not was like eighty percent old vine Zinfandel. Sure, it was a gallon of wine, like because they, they didn't up and down the that, the, the, that, that's up what and down it, the Central Coast. Not the Central Coast, the uh, Central Valley. Yeah, it was it was old vines in, and and hearty Burgundy and white Zinfandel kept the California wine industry yeah. alive to where we are today. Where Sutter we have Home. Wine. Sutter Home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. Sutter. <laughs> now you own by Glen. yeah, now owned by Nabisco or something right. like you know. It, so giant, or like, or like even something even weirder, like Sutter Home now yeah. owned by like, like Nestle. Glaxo. Ne- Nestle owns like everything. Yeah, everything. Right. <laughs> uh, and so then, so then, and then, um, and then, so it was a bunch of us started getting a little more serious about it and started drinking a little bit more. And then one of us, you know, we had we if you had a parent who kept had wine, you started drinking their wine. And then, um, and then you, and then I think as you sort of go and become a young adult and you're on your own, you start thinking a little bit more about okay, well, I could keep this for five years or. Uh, or what are the what are the wines that I like that I that are maybe a little bit of a budget stretch but are delicious. Mm-hmm. So at that point in California when I moved there and before 
uh, 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 the Roan Rangers were big. So Bonnie Doon was there. Yep. And um, Cigar Volant people were talking about. And that was this incredibly delicious Roan wine that we really, people did not drink that much. Mm-hmm. Um, that weren't on that many lists. Yep. Uh, uh, people like Kermit Lynch were the ones importing that, but they were kind of the only ones. Right. Um, and then as you sort of, as your taste sort of broaden and you, you decide what you like to eat, uh, you know, like what's better than a big, you know, sharp, minerally, Loire white and a dozen oysters. That's like a really good meal. That or a Riesling. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. know, exactly. Some high acid, just yeah. mineral. No, it, it's, it, it does come together. What was, what was, if you had to pick a bottle, what was the bottle one that really hooked you if you, if you were? Well, it was probably Santa Steph. Okay. It was probably a uh, uh, cost de, de tournel. Um and it was probably uh, an eighty, mm-hmm. like because it was a long time ago. Long yeah. um, and you think, oh, oh, I get it. Oh, I, oh, oh, yeah. This is actually ch- changing, and it, it, this is a living product that I'm drinking that is going to change in the bottle, change in the glass. That's going to have weird depth to it. It's that yes, some of this like wine talk is pretentious and irritating. But it's true also. Yeah. Like, it, it is true. And as long as you enjoy it, really enjoy it as a category, uh, instead of as a way to, like, be smart, um, I think you're okay. Like, my, my rule is when I go to a restaurant uh, that's a good, you know, good restaurant where it looks like it ha- they have somebody who's in charge of the wine list, I always ask for that person. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I don't care. Like, I don't know anything about these wines. Tell me. Here's kind of what I like. And then almost everyone, I, don't, I mean, even if like, you go to Restaurant Danielle, is a great wine list. The Psalms there, there's like four of them. They, that, they, will, they want to stand there and talk to you. Yep. And, like, and when you say, listen, yep. I'm not, I don't want to spend more than 50 bucks. They're like, oh, okay, well, then you want this Yeah, one. exactly. Then, like, then, then they really geek yeah. out. You yeah. Know? <clears throat> and I feel like that's, what, that's probably what people who, who, who love wine or want to love wine uh, should just do more. Just put those people to work. They're, that's what they're there for. Mm. Mm. Well, Rob, um, you're a very busy man. So busy. Thank you for finding – Professor Professor. Professor, Long. thank you. Yeah, Professor Long. as of and, it's 12 o'clock today. Yeah, and then he's got a he's got you know he's got a he's got to dip out because he you know these these L A type people he, you know he I know he got the call he's got a meeting but really so much fun I could talk to you for another three hours we're gonna have to get together hang out drink yeah, we some got more wine left here yeah what's going on um, you know um uh tell people where they can find you like you know, you know Ricochet Martini Shot where can people find you be a part of what you're doing uh Martini Shot just go to uh, Martini Shot podcast. I think that's the place. It's also on all the regular places uh, where you find your fine, where your fine podcasts delivered. I'm sure the same here, like uh, Apple and yeah, Stitcher, Apple, and Stitcher, all those places, Audible, Spotify. Spotify. Yeah. Um, well, man, thanks again. This is so much fun. Big shout out to our engineer Miles who hey, engineered Miles. this. Miles was like, "Hey, man, um, you know, I got a buddy. He's really into <laughs> wine. I told him about your podcast." You know, he's like, he's not, he's not, he's not like, I know he's not like in the wine business, but you should have him on. And he's like, I was like, all right, yeah. He's like, his name's Rob Long. He, he used to drive. I was like, done, get him on here. Wow. And so, um, you it's a really good miles of pressure, by the way. Yeah. So we, we really file, we really <laughs> finally made it happen. Now this is great. Look, I mean, anytime people are sitting around drinking wine, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. So we'll do it again, man. You're a friend of the show. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's your boy, MJ. Uh, thanks for listening to Black Wine Guy Experience. Here's to all the, uh, all my wonderful people out there who are mavericks, philosophers, deep thinkers, and wine drinkers. You check all those boxes, Rob. Everybody, peace.